Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture six. And in this segment, we'll take a look at some conceptual questions and some other conceptual takeaways from the geostrophic wind equations that we derived in the previous segment, and also take a look at an exercise to sort of check your understanding. So with that, we'll go ahead and dive into it. So just to refresh your memory, these were the lovely equations that we derived in the previous lecture, or excuse me, the previous segment. So zonal component of the geostrophic wind is equal to that. Meridional component of the geostrophic wind is equal to that. So that's if you're working on a constant height or just the same Z coordinate. And if you're working on the same pressure level or the same pressure coordinate, then this would be the form you use on the right-hand side. And I do want to go ahead and again highlight the key differences here. In the case of working on an isobaric surface, which is a surface of constant pressure, you don't have density. And instead of the pressure gradient, you have the gradient in geopotential height or geopotential. Whereas if you're working on a constant uh, Z level, that is a constant height surface, then you're working with pressure gradient. So just want to make sure that those two are kept very distinct and make sure that I distinguish those two forms of the geostrophic wind. Now, let me go ahead and, and pose the following question to you. In what geographic regions might geostrophic wind not be well modeled? You can feel free to pause the video and think about it for a few seconds. So the answer to this question is, the key to the answer to this question lies in the fact that we have this one over Coriolis parameter in both forms of the geostrophic wind. So if you think back to our lecture on Coriolis force, you may remember that as you get closer towards the equator, the Coriolis parameter goes to zero. And of course, if your Coriolis parameter goes to zero, that means what's on the right-hand side here will tend to go towards either positive infinity or negative infinity. I don't know about you, but I don't think we normally observe infinitely strong winds at the equator. So that's right away a red flag when we're using when we try to use the geostrophic wind equations that we derived earlier. And in fact, they don't apply themselves very well when you're in a region that's very close to the equator or, say, in a region that's in the subtropics, that is, between... Uh, 23.5 degrees north and 23.5 degrees south. However, geostrophic wind does work pretty well if you're in a geostrof geographic region known as the mid-latitudes, which is usually defined as between about 30 degrees north and 60 degrees north in the northern hemisphere, or about 30 degrees south and 60 degrees south in the southern hemisphere. And sometimes you can fudge the boundaries a little bit. You can maybe get away with using the geostrophic wind at, say, 25 degrees north. Uh, just keep in mind that as you do get closer to the equator, that geostrophic wind might become exaggerated because, again, you have that uh, inverse dependency of the Coriolis parameter. That is, as you get closer to the equator, your geostrophic wind or your result on the right-hand side might start getting ridiculously large, and it's not really representative of what's actually going on in the atmosphere. So just something to keep in mind. And another thing I want to highlight here is what's on again, lies on the right-hand side here. And you'll notice that if I have a strong pressure gradient, that means I have a very strong pressure gradient force. And that in turn also means that we have a stronger geostrophic wind. So if the pressure gradient is very weak, that means that our pressure gradient force is very weak. And that means that our geostrophic wind would be very weak. And if we go on the opposite end of that, if we say that we have, if we have a very strong pressure gradient, that means we have a very strong pressure gradient force. And that, therefore, means that we have a stronger geostrophic wind. So as the pressure gradient gets stronger and the pressure gradient force gets stronger, that means our geostrophic wind also has to get stronger. So that's something that's kind of important to keep in mind when you're looking at, say, a weather map. If you see an area where the pressure gradient force is really strong, that would imply that the geostrophic wind is also very strong. So that's going to do it for this conceptual side. Now I'll go ahead and introduce you to this little exercise. So this is a pretty similar setup. You'll actually notice that this is almost the same setup that we had when we introduced the pressure gradient force in lecture two. So consider a 1,005 millibar low that is situated 500 kilometers to the west of a 1015 millibar high at a latitude of 40 degrees north. An air parcel with a density of one kilogram per cubic meter is situated halfway between the low and the high. Determine the speed of the geostrophic wind given this information. So I'll go ahead and ask you to pause the video and take about five to 10 minutes and attempt to arrive at some sort of answer. So hopefully the solution that you got looks something like what's about to be shown up on the screen here. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. Now, again, just want to reemphasize, it's a good idea to draw a detailed diagram just to sort of get a bearing on what your answer should look like. And I'm actually going to do this two different ways. There are two different ways to actually verify the result that you get. One is to use the right-hand rule that we had before. So if we consider a top-down view, 
where the k hat unit vector or the upward unit vector is coming directly at us. Hopefully you remember that's what the simple means. It means the vector that's pointing directly at us if we're looking at it, uh, looking at something two, a two-dimensional plane like this. And again, we're looking at the halfway point, so 250 kilometer distance between the high and the low. Now, if we want to use the right-hand rule, well, we have the k-hat unit vector and our pressure gradient, not the pressure gradient force, but the pressure gradient itself points from the low to the high. So our pressure gradient points in that direction. And if we want to use the right-hand rule, k-hat, again, is our thumb. The pressure gradient is our index finger. And then if we extend the middle finger, make sure you have to extend the other fingers as well. Otherwise, you might give someone a gesture that they don't very much appreciate. So make sure the other fingers are extended. But if you do that and distort your arm a little bit, hopefully not too much, you'll see that your middle finger does in fact point upward on the screen. So we would expect geostrophic wind vector to point from south to north when we go to calculate what the actual value is. So if we don't get a geostrophic wind vector that points from south to north, then we know that we went wrong somewhere. So and that's using the right-hand rule, but there's another way to approach this. So again, just geostrophic wind pointing from south to north, but in fact, there is another way that we can approach this. And that involves using the, ge again, using a ge definition of the geostrophic wind, which is again, we have a force balance between the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force. You know, if we consider the direction of the pressure gradient force, that points from the higher pressure to the lower pressure. So that means our pressure gradient force points to the west here. And in order for this to be a force balance, the Coriolis force must be equal in magnitude and pointing in the opposite direction. So if our pressure gradient force points from east to west, that means our Coriolis force must point from west to east. Now, the only way that the Coriolis force can point from west to east in the northern hemisphere, again, something to keep in mind, the only way that this can be the case is if our geostrophic wind vector points to the north. Because remember, Coriolis force acts to the right of whatever's in motion. If our geostrophic wind is moving from south to north, then we have a Coriolis force that's pointing in an easterly direction, which is the opposite direction of the pressure gradient force. So that's a bit that's kind of a logical argument that you can use to also determine the direction of the geostrophic force. We arrive at the same answer whether we use the right-hand rule or the logic that we used in the second case, but there's just two ways that you can check to make sure that your answer does in fact make sense, just using a bit of a conceptual uh, conceptual tool in your toolbox to make sure that you are you are in fact arriving at a sensible answer. So again, just to reiterate that, reiterate that logical statement that we had earlier, pressure gradient force points from east to west, in order for there to be a force balance, there must be a force that's pointing in the opposite direction, which would be our Coriolis force. By definition of the geostrophic wind, it has to be the Coriolis force. And the only way that the Coriolis force can point from west to east is if our wind is pointing from south to north. And that then tells us what direction our geostrophic wind should be. So now that we have that, let's actually get into the math of it. So uh, oftentimes what's useful to uh, start with is to calculate the Coriolis parameter to make your life a little bit easier. So if we just plug in the numbers that we had, again, omega, that's just the angular velocity of Earth's rotation, which is 2 pi over 86,400 seconds, times the sine of our latitude, which is 40 degrees north, so that's sine of positive 40 degrees. And we get a Coriolis parameter that's 9.35 times 10 to the minus fifth radians per second. And if we go to plug in the equation from our geostrophic wind, so starting with the zonal component, we get that this actually equals zero because if you look at this point here, there is no pressure gradient in the meridional direction. The pressure only varies in the x direction. It does not vary in the y direction at our specific point here. So the zonal component is zero. There's no zonal component in the geostrophic one at all. Then if we go to the meridional component, we plug in the values that we had there. So that's one over f times rho dp dx. And if we plug in all those lovely numbers and then convert all of our units to what they should be, we should get a result that looks like 21.34 meters per second, which is about 45 miles per hour. Now you might be thinking that seems like a little, it's a little bit fast, and it is, and that's mainly because we have not accounted for friction, but we're not gonna worry about friction just yet, although we will start worrying about friction in the next segment. But for now, this is mostly just a check to make sure that you understand the definition of geostrophic wind and to make sure that uh, you could solve a problem like this if it presented itself. So that's going to do it for this segment, and as I mentioned just a few seconds ago, in the next segment we're going to start talking about the force of friction and some of the physical consequences of friction. So with that, 
I will see you all in the next segment.